The Evolution of the Vertebrate Eye, a Molecular Perspective Let's start by talking about the living fossil, Platanaris dumeruli. It's a polychaete worm, same family as earthworms. It possesses a prototypical pigment cup eye. It might win a prize for the ugliest whatever. Even H.R. Geiger would be inspired by this guy. Here's the larval eye at 24 hours, traced from EM micrographs. The yellow are rhabdomeric photoreceptor cells. The green are pigment cells. These two cells are the simplest possible visual system. This eye senses light, direction, even color. It directly couples to other cells, no nerves at this stage. No lens, brain, nerves, and only a one-cell retina. Here's the same eye at 72 hours in the proto-adult. The development of structures has led to enhanced directionality. This eye can be used for locating. Nerves will begin to grow toward the rhabdomere because of its surface markers. No lens, single cell retina, a single optical nerve, no brain. Here's the adult pigment eye. It's really just a cluster of the larval eye parts created by repeated duplication. This eye has no lens, a multicellular retina, nerves, and a simple brain. This is the stereotypical progression in embryonic development in bilaterians. It also gives us an idea of the evolutionary progression from the ur bilaterians. All of these forms exist in animals extant today. In fact, here we see a cellular level view of the retinas of the ascidian, hagfish, lamprey, and nastostoma. These closely related organisms show a great deal of diversity in eye structure but all clearly evolve from two basic cell types, the rhabdomeric and ciliary photoreceptor cell. In vertebrates, this correlates to rod and cone cells respectively. With this close-up, you can begin to see why cone and rod cells got their names. Each of these terminates in a simple synaptic terminal, which is where the retina meets a nerve ending. All sensory tissues have these types of terminals, suggesting that the complex eye could have evolved from a simple eye spot. It does not require the special growth of new neural pathways in development. Let's take a closer look at the photoreceptor cells. Why are they special? Well, they contain chemicals called opsins. Ciliary photoreceptors contain a broad diversity of these, of which the best known is rhodopsin, derived from vitamin A. This is why your mother told you to eat your carrots if you want to see well in the dark. The emergence in bilaterians, that's animals with bilateral symmetry, of these specialized light-sensing opsins provide a test for evolution. What can we learn about the eye from examining the data produced by a field called comparative genomics? If the theory of common descent is true, we should see a pattern of genetic similarity that matches the stages of development of eye complexity. I've used one of my favorite metagenomic tools, homologene. It will search the genomic databases at the NCBI for homologous genes between organisms. It will calculate the variation in protein sequence between different organisms. If the modern theory of evolution is true, I would expect to see relatedness among all the animals tested. I would also expect to see that genes that are present in the simplest visual system would be highly conserved in the complex vertebrate eye. We should also be able to tell, based on the accumulation of heritable changes, which genes are most ancient and which are most recent. We should also be able to find plausible alternative functions for the ancestors of the visual genes. Part 1. Relatedness. If we start with comparing the chimpanzee visual system to that of humans, Almost no differences can be detected. We need to zoom out a little to see any differences at all. Here is a comparison of several important visual system genes across a variety of mammals versus the human protein sequence. Blue is dog, red is cow, and yellow is mouse. Note that all three mammals have about the same proteins for eye formation, as we might expect. This data suggests that PIN2IP and OPSIN4 are more recent in humans or have weaker selection than the truly essential genes like PAX6, which is the homeobox gene that determines where eyes are formed. Genes such as rhodopsin, opsin1, 
and transducin are all very highly conserved, and these are the earliest visual system genes. Part 2. Primitive visual genes are highly conserved. Here's transducin, the protein that transmits the signal from the opsins. Note that it is a very highly conserved between humans and fish, and that we also find a very similar protein sequence in a variety of plants. This gene must be a very early component of the signaling from opsin activation. Here's guanine nucleotide binding protein, GNBP, also a signaling component of the simplest visual system, and we find it in vertebrate rods and cones, as well as in chickens and fruit flies, minimally changed. Note that genetic change corresponds to the evolutionary distance as based on morphology and fossil evidence. Part 3. We should see which genes are ancient and which are most recent. We've already seen some ancient genes shared between plant leaves and vertebrate eyes. What genes are more recent? Here is Pax 6, which is incredibly conserved between vertebrates as far away as ch fish and chickens, but more distantly related in fruit flies. I would predict that Pax 6 had a predecessor in early bilaterians, but that it was modified after the vertebrates and invertebrates parted ways. This would make sense considering the differences in eye morphology between flies and humans. Part 4. All genes should have a plausible explanation for alternative functions. Well, here's a list of genes and their paralog functions. Opsins, for example, have a function in circadian rhythms in single-celled organisms, and they're responsible for some blue-green phototaxis and algae. Transducins and GNBPs are both signal transduction cascade proteins. Uh, they interact with a number of different membrane-bound receptors. Atonal, Pax6, and FOXA2 are all in the family of basic helix-loop helix transcription factors, and they're all used in the formation of multiple sensory systems. Cryptochromes are found uh, in all varieties of animals, uh, but they are related to bacterial photolyase, which repair UV-induced DNA damage uh, using actual light energy. They are also involved in circadian rhythms. I know plausible explanations have been given for the evolution of the physiology of the vertebrate eye, but I wish to advance a theory on the genomic evolution of that eye. One plausible scenario is that in the genome of an early heterotrophic eukaryote, a cryptochrome became fused with a transmembrane domain, containing a transducin binding site. This one change produces the first opsin and provides a way for the cell to react to light, which would have been an increase in fitness for a photosynthetic cell. These genes were inherited by all subsequent eukaryotes, but the evolution of specialized eye structures was via the transposition of the opsin gene with a basic helix-loop helix promoter sequence from another gene. These specialized eye structures would also be selected for and inherited. That gives rise to a whole family of genes specialized for light capture, signal transduction, and eye structural elements. In conclusion, the vertebrate eye is marvelous and complex, but it's also highly possible by incremental changes by natural processes we can observe today. Evolution of the eye, the lens. Let's examine the lens of the eye, then decide if it was designed or evolved. What is the lens? It's the part of the eye that focuses light onto the retina. It is composed of three parts, the capsule, the epithelium, and the fibers. The lens capsule is a basement membrane, a type of structure common in tissues that need a degree of adhesion to other tissues. It surrounds and protects the lens but it's not unique to the eye. The lens epithelium is inside the capsule. It is a simple cuboidal epithelium, and like the same cells in the kidney and thyroid, it regulates the exchange of nutrients, fluids, and salts. These cells are also not unique to the eye. Lastly, we come to the lens fiber cells. They derive from the epithelium, as shown here. They are clear, long, and thin, and some no longer possess nuclei or organelles. Now, these are unique to the eye. Let's focus on lens fiber cells. They are packed tightly and use gap junctions to generate lamina, or layers. 
Note the hook and hole arrangement in this EM micrograph. So here's the question. Did the lens fiber evolve or was it designed? If it was designed, we should see irreducible, irreducible complexity. That is, no part of the system is functional without all of the parts being intact. Specified information. The information to make the lens fiber must have been created by the designer for this structure. Fine-tuning. The structure is specifically designed for the function it is being employed in. If it was evolved, we should see functional independence. The parts of the lens fiber have putative independent functions. Genetic homology. The information for making lens fibers must have arisen from existing information. Adaptation. The lens fiber should show evidence of prior alternative usage. So, is it irreducibly complex or is it functionally independent? Well, let's answer the simple questions. Do eyes exist that do not have lens fibers? Yes, lots of them. Does an eye without a lens work for vision? Yes, very poorly, but it does work. Are there proteins and lens fibers that are irreducibly complex? That's the interesting question. What proteins do we find in lens fibers? Well, 90% of their mass is a class of proteins called crystallins. Crystallins are highly soluble proteins that refract light and are responsible for the bending of light in the lens. They are very stable proteins, seemingly designed as the perfect biological lens material. But are they examples of evolution or design? It turns out all the crystalline genes have evolved from other genes. We can identify which genes by their protein sequence similarities. Researchers studying crystalline in humans made a startling discovery. The protein that allows us to see and focus was being made in embryonic heart and kidney and in aggressively growing cancer cells. It turns out many of the crystalline proteins have other functions in embryology. Crystalline in mammals has strong homology to quinone reductase and alcohol dehydrogenase. And some of the subunits are still functional chaperonins, proteins that help fold other proteins. So clearly not irreducibly complex. Specified complexity versus genetic homology. Is the information for making crystallins specified complex information, or can it be found in animals without lenses? Well, let's do a protein-protein homology search on crystallins. Here's the homology for crystalline alpha B. All vertebrates have about the same sequence. Invertebrates have some differences. Here's crystalline alpha A. Same thing. All vertebrates are almost identical. Invertebrates are similar but divergent. That's not even the good bit. Look what I get when I specify matches only in bacteria. And this too. In fact, there are over 200 matches for bacteria with crystalline alpha B. The top matches are all soil fauna for some reason, like Nitrococcus here, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in root nodules. So the crystalline genes all appear to have come from duplication and divergence of existing genes. So, no on irreducible complexity, no on specified information. What about three, specificity of forms? Is there any sort of prior art that exists for the lens? Is it optimally and universally designed? Well, first the obvious answers. Is the lens optimally and universally designed? Well, no. Many organisms possess lenses distinct from the modern vertebrate lens. Modern insects and ancient trilobite calcite eyes uh, show different lens architectures. So that's no to universal optimal design. Is there any structure of the eye that does not exist elsewhere in the human body? Only the lens fiber cells. Uh, the capsule, as we mentioned, was a standard basement membrane. The epithelium is a standard simple cuboidal epithelium. Is there a prior art to the eye? Well, yes, certain unicellular organisms possess an eye spot organelle. They are composed of a region of photoreceptors shaded by red pigments, making them blue-green specific. The heterotroph euglena is shown here. 
Okay, is there a prior art to the lens? Yes, the waxy cuticle epithelial cells in plants and some algae are intentionally transparent. So is the lens of the eye designed or evolved? The evidence is clear. How did the evolution of the lens likely occur? Well, here's a likely scenario. Start with low expression of ADH in all tissues. Always expressed at a low level, no matter what. That's what we call constitutive expression. This is typical for all genes not under tight control. The constitutive gene product comes under tight control by a regulatory pathway related to eye development. The constitutively expressed gene, ADH, becomes tightly controlled as part of development. There is a selection for proteins that do not interfere with optical transmission. The constitutive gene duplicates and diverges, resulting in a normal, non-lens form and a specialized form in lens development, now an early crystalline gene. There are now two different gene products, subject to different selection pressures, but still structurally similar. Now, why does any of this matter? Because every year, thousands of babies are born with cataracts due to genetic defects. Understanding where these defects come from, what genes are involved, and how animal models are applicable may help us diagnose and treat babies born with genetic defects. It does matter. Evolution of the lacrimal gland. This is the lacrimal gland. Either spelling is correct. It produces tears. Tears protect the eyes from scratches and infections. They moisten and coat the eye. They can also show emotion, like disappointment in the white man's carelessness. If you were born after 1978, you may need to ask your parents about this reference. There are three types of tears, basal, reflex, and emotional. Basal tears are composed by weight of 96% water, 3.5% salts, and 0.5% other. It's the 0.5% other that I want to focus on. That 0.5% is mucin, glycerophospholipids, lysozyme, lactoferrin, lipocalin, lacrotin, immunoglobulins, and glucose. Are any of these unique to tear fluid? No, as it turns out, all those components are present in other fluids. Mucin, for example, is present in all mucus, all mucous membranes. Glyso, gly, sorry, glycerophospholipids are also in all mucus. Lysozyme is found in saliva and mucus. Lactoferrin is found in milk, saliva, and mucus. Lipocalin is found in saliva, mucus, and even in the nerve sheath. Lacridin is found in saliva. Immunoglobulins are found throughout the body. And, of course, glucose is found in every cell in the body. So tears are very similar to saliva and mucus. So there's nothing unique being produced by the lacrimal gland. It's also structurally very similar to other exocrine glands, like the pancreas, salivary, mammary glands. So here's the lacrimal gland compared to the pancreas and the gallbladder. So what gene controls the development of this specialized exocrine gland that produces watery mucus? In humans, it's OTX1, short for orthodentical homeobox 1. If evolution is true, we would predict a pattern of homology to other mammals. As it turns out, all mammals have 97% protein homology to the human OTX1 gene product, despite DNA sequences showing increasing differences with evolutionary distance. Even fish, as I, and as I will show, flies have OTX1. Drosophila has a homeobox gene that is homologous to OTX1 called OTD, short for orthodentical. It controls many aspects of eye development, but how similar is it? How about if we cut the gene out of flies and paste it into mice in place of OTX1? Here's the wild-type mouse lacrimal gland, it's marked LG, but if we knock out the OTX1 gene, no more lacrimal gland. This is called an OTX1 minus mutant, or knockout. What if we substitute in the Drosophila fly OTD gene? Hey, we get the flacrimal glands back. So a fly gene for eye development is functional to make tear glands in a mouse. Flies don't even have tear ducts. How could the fly gene do this? 
because OTX is the product of evolution. It evolved from a gene in the common ancestor of flies and mice. It turns out mice have CRX, OTX1, and OTX2. CRX is a cone rod homeobox. OTX1 and OTX2 are involved in brain and eye development. Can we infer any kind of relationship between CTX, OTX1, and OTX2? How similar are they? Very similar. These three genes are clearly related to each other. And they all three share a strong homology to the fly OTD gene. So here's a plausible explanation for the evolution of the lacrimal gland. Step 1. A homeo homeobox gene for an exocrine gland in bilaterians duplicates and diverges over time, producing an OT-like gene. The OTD-like transcription factor becomes associated with eye and brain development. Later duplication and divergence result in specialized homeobox genes for different processes in development. One of these is OTX1 invertebrates. The exocrine-related genes are currently being driven by another bicoid transcription factor. This bicoid transcription factor is specific to, I don't know, pancreas, gastric, or salivary glands specific homeoboxes. I'm guessing salivary, which is Hox B13, because of the similarities in expressed proteins. The bicoid transcription factor, binding site, mutates to be preferentially bound by OTX1 producing a new exocrine gland attached to the eye. It secretes a saliva-like coating over the eye, protecting it and increasing fitness in the organism. Over time, more genes join the OTX1 enhanced cluster, producing modern lacrimal glands. Thank you, and please, don't litter.